Okay, ready, set, go. Let's bust this out. I'm going to try to crank out two videos all at once, starting with the Cube UV video. And so I'm just going to bust through this. Ready? First thing you do, of course, every time you start a new uh, Maya project, you go to the project window and you click new project. You go Cube UV and you're going to set the project to wherever your Maya Projects folder is, which in my case is a folder called Maya Projects in Progress. And I'm gonna select that folder and it's gonna create this folder inside of this folder. I click accept and now I have that folder created with all the default folders, which if you look at it in Windows, this CubeUV folder now contains all these default folders. The ones that you're concerned with, of course, are the scenes folder where the Maya file should go and the source images folder where the textures go. Source images folder. Uh, we'll come back to that uh, in a bit, but let's just blast this out. All right, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna make a cereal box, right? If you're uh, following along with me in class, polycube, I'm just gonna drag it up a little bit above the grid, pretending like the grid's the floor. I'm gonna squish it down, scale it up a little, roughly cereal box shaped, you know? Yeah, close enough. Good enough. Not really trying to be super precise or care about it too much. Uh, maybe squish it down a little. Yeah. Let's call that uh, let's call that good enough. So again, I'm not really worried about it because um, there's all kinds of cereal boxes, different sizes, shapes. It's no big deal. Um, and we can just use Photoshop to chop up textures and fit it in there. Uh, but this is it. Now we got to UV map it. This is pointless as it is. This just looks stupid unless you actually put textures on it. So let's put some textures on it. Well, UV mapping. Uh, and again, I get a little more thorough, uh, I, I talk more thoroughly about the theory and the concept of UV mapping in class. I don't really want to waste that much time in the video for that. I'd rather um, just make the video a little bit more step-by-step. Uh, -step. Here's how to do it, like a recipe. So again, Windows UV Editor to get to the UV Texture Editor window. Uh, I'm just going to, again, I, I would rather make more use of my, my monitor, but for the purpose of demonstrating, I'm just going to shove this kind of on top of this over here. In fact, you know what? Let me get rid of my one of my windows there. Um, so I can go, let's see. Ah, all right, I'll move this for a second. Uh, so I can get rid of my, my status line just to free up a few more pixels. Uh, you notice I do like to hide a lot of my UI because I don't use it. So I'd rather free up more pixels for my viewport. Uh, okay, but again, fair warning, um, I say this in class a bunch of times over and over, if I see an upside down T shape like this, that means you haven't done shit and you will get an automatic fail. So no upside down T shapes, because I'll know you haven't done anything. Um, actually, in, in fact, this is, this is worse than an automatic fail. This is an automatic zero, because you didn't actually do anything. So don't, don't turn into anything that has an upside down T shape, okay? Um, the other thing, again, I'll just, just re remind you, the other thing that gets an automatic fail is automatic mapping. So if you select an object, shift right click, mapping, automatic map, this is also incorrect. This is an automatic fail, but it may not be an automatic zero. At least you tried to cheat. It just sucks and it's not good. So don't ever do automatic mapping. It's not good. It's not meant for... Not really sure what it's meant for, it's just stupid, so don't do it. Uh, I'm gonna do that. So, if you're not supposed to use automatic mapping, what are you supposed to use? Let's go through the steps. Ready? First step always go into face mode. Oh, and also, I should say, I just did it and I didn't say it, but always turn on this. Uh, this one turns on per object, so each object you create, you're gonna need to. Uh, turn on the show texture borders um, so that way it'll show the seams in the viewport for you um, okay so turn on show texture borders toggle that on also this one this one stays on usually uh, whenever you have Maya open if you turn it on it'll stay on as long as you have Maya open but that is shaded UV, uh, toggle shaded UV display that's pretty handy um, makes it easier to see what's going on here in the in the uh, texture uh, in the UV map that is uh, the, the checker pattern uh, again, just to make things clear, the whole point of the checker pattern is to see distortion. And there are better checker patterns out there. There's uh, 
This is just built into Maya now. Um, this is new, by the way. Again, this is a difference from my old video to my new video. This didn't exist until recently, but having the ability to just turn a checker pattern on with a click saves you a few steps. If you want to watch my old video, you can watch my old video to see how the uh, kind of the older process works. I'm not going to get into that right now because it's in my old video, so you can go watch that if you want. Uh, but there you go. I can toggle that on and off. Um, I usually toggle it off when I'm making selections and then turn it on to check my distortion when I need to see if there's distortion. So let's get to it. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is, again, in face mode, I'm going to marquee select right through the middle. Um, and so I have uh, basically everything except for the top and the bottom selected. If you mouse or, or if you rotate around, every face is selected except for the top and the bottom. And you notice also that it um, makes an identical selection here in the texture editor. So that, um, again, whatever you select here happens here and vice versa. Um, oh, and then also I should, I should um, also make the point that this viewport works just like the cam the regular camera controls, which is Alt and right click to zoom, Alt and middle mouse click to pan, Alt and left click also pans because there is no rotate because it's a two dimensional viewport. Because that's the whole point is to unwrap the 3D model to become a two dimensional surface that you can paint on. Anyways, uh, but uh, so we've got the whole middle selected, not the top, not the bottom. And then the first thing we're going to do is shift right click, mapping, planar, and then it's kind of just barely at the bottom. Um, so uh, planar map, in this case, Z. Now why Z? Well, check it out. <laughs> why Z? Uh, so Z, why, why did we choose the Z? Because look, if you look at this little widget down here, the Z is pointing this way. And that way faces the largest surface area. Because projecting a map towards this edge, this, this side panel, doesn't make sense because it's smaller than this. Project always, whichever faces you choose, whatever faces you choose to make a shell out of, project towards the greatest number of faces or the largest faces. That is, you know, the largest surface area. That's what you project towards. Now, theoretically, it shouldn't matter which faces you project towards. It should just matter that you created a shell and then unfolding should take care of the rest. However, like I've told you in class, Maya sucks. Maya sucks with UVs. Not, not just in general, but Maya sucks with UVs in particular. So there are better programs out there that might handle these UVs better. But we're teaching Maya, so you want to know how to use a Maya pipeline just in case. Anyways, so projecting towards the largest surface area gives Maya the best possible chance at not screwing things up. So when you try to unfold, Maya has a better chance of not bursting into flames and just frustrating the hell out of you. Okay, so anyways, we projected towards the largest surface area. Notice notice now that because I have the texture seams turned on, notice that the seams are now around the top and bottom panels, but no seams around the sides now. So that changed the seams. Um, it's created a new shell, and I'm going to click and drag this off to the side, and it's created this new shell that I can um, start to manipulate, and these other two, sh it, it cut off these other two shells, which are the top and bottom panel. So again, you can mouse over it and see. Um, top and bottom panel, and then this new shell that goes all the way around. Now, can I unfold this like it is? No. And I will show you what will happen if that if you try, if you grab the shell, and so first of all you have to go to UV mode, and then marquee select the entire shell, and then again shift right click again because I use marquee menus, they're better, but you have to go to the unfold options, which again options are always the square, you should all know that by now. So unfold options gives you this dialog. Now it defaults, if you reset settings, it defaults to unfold 3D. That's Maya's new, this is again a different thing, you know, this is a difference between my new video and my old video. This didn't exist until recently. It's new, which means it should be cool. But no, it sucks. It, it, it has consistently screwed up quite a few things that it should not have screwed up. I would say don't use it. Um, you, you could try it if you want, but I keep getting emails right now from students going, ah, what the hell? Why isn't this working? How come, how come Maya sucks? Well, it sucks because you're trusting it to do this new thing that it's, it doesn't know how to do. So, so don't, don't let it do this. Go to the options, change it from Unfold 3D to Legacy, and then double check this. This is, again, a bug. Many times, I've seen this happen a lot at work and at home. Many times you switch from Unfold to Legacy, 
This is supposed to say 5,000, which it does this time, but I've seen it, if you go back and forth, I've seen it before where somehow you go back and forth and then this changes to one. If this max maximum iterations changes to one, you're gonna hit apply and nothing's gonna happen, which again, could be very frustrating. That's a bug, it's not supposed to happen. I have noticed that it seems to happen less with Maya 2016, but it still happens. I've seen it already a few times this semester. So, once again, switch from Unfold 3D, which is the default, to Legacy. And then um, we'll worry about this in a little while, uh, probably in the next video. But um, maximum iterations, make sure that says 5,000, hit apply. Okay, now again, this didn't work. Why didn't this work? I mean, I double checked all these settings. It just imploded. It's like, ah, what the hell is that? Okay, well, that's because you're trying to unfold this scenario here, this box, but it's solid all the way around. There is no seam. You have to cut a seam in this case. Not all cases, not all cases do you have to cut a seam. But look at it. I mean, if you don't cut an edge, like for instance, if I cut this edge right here, in fact, let me undo before, uh, so the unfold isn't there. But if I go into edge mode, grab this edge, and I shift right click cut UVs, so I cut that seam. Now notice there's a seam on, in the viewport, you see it. Um, if I cut that seam, that gives it a place to unfold from. Um, so I can now go to UV mode, grab the UVs, and I literally don't even have to change anything, I just hit apply, and there it is. That is a nicely unfolded shell. And how, do, how can I tell it's nicely unfolded? Well, first of all, the shell looks appropriate, um, in fact, let me um, just move this out of the way for a second. So it looks appropriate to me, just from eyeballing it. You know, it looks like side panel, so, you know, side panel, front panel. In fact, you just mouse over it. But here's, again, here's how you actually check. Turn on the checker pattern. Turn on the checker pattern, zoom in, and make sure, are these squares nice and square? Because these squares are supposed to be nice and square. If those squares, if they're stretched, if they're twisted, if they're like, you know, squiggly or wavy, then you know you've got a problem. This is the whole point of this checker pattern is to is to solve distortion, to find distortion. So if you unwrap a shell and you have nice, clean, perfect squares, then that shell is good to go. That's nicely unfolded. So I'll turn that back off. No, actually, I'll leave it back. On. I'll leave it on uh, because I still have two shells to unfold. So I'm going to go to UV mode again. Grab this shell. This is the bottom. So watch what happens when I hit apply. Bam. So it see that it jumps. Uh, from that weird the other shape to this shape and then now nice clean squares again that shell is now unfolded now that shell is just a face at this point but we'll fix that later uh, but now I can go to this shell grab that shell hit apply again bam suddenly there's nice clean squares it's good to go now for those of you that may be watching this that aren't in my class or maybe you're in the online class I want to make something clear that I, I really make a point to talk about in class which is this these squares are larger than these squares. Those are smaller squares. So in class, again, I verbally quiz people and try to make them think, you know, do them. I know it sucks, especially for the morning classes. Oh man, you're kind of trying to make me think right now. I haven't had enough coffee or Red Bull. Okay, well, what's the difference? What's the difference between the, the large squares and the small squares? The answer to save us all some time is resolution. The smaller squares imply that this shell this shell right here, the smaller the squares, the higher the resolution. So this, uh, if you imagine this as, a, as an actual cereal box, this would be a nice high res texture here, and this would be super pixelated and, and gross uh, by, by comparison. So what does that mean? Well, clearly that means that you want to ideally keep the resolution consistent. Uh, you want to uh, spread the resolution evenly across all the surfaces. And let me show you the quickest, easiest way to do that. If I just marquee select all the shells at once in UV mode, I can go to polygons, layout, options, and that loads over here, and I'll drag it over here. Now, there's a bunch of crazy options here. Now, the spacing presets, you can play with that if you want. If you know what size map you're gonna use, you're, oh, I'm gonna use a 1024 map. You can do that if you want. Now, realistically though, mostly what I use this for, let me reset settings real quick. Mostly what I use this window for, I don't really even use it for the layout purpose, which is kind of funny because the whole you know thing says layout UVs options. Well, I don't actually care about the layout that it gives me. 
Yes, it does lay it out in the one-to-one, -one, which is this, by the way, the, the lighter gray area. Yes, it'll lay it out for you, but I don't always necessarily care for the layout it gives me. What I do care for is this prescale world. I hit apply, and oops, let me, uh, let me undo that. Let me show you actually in the viewport. Um, so let me turn the checkers on. Check it out, watch the checkers. I'm gonna hit apply, you can't see it, I'm off screen, but I hit apply, bam. Look what happens. First of all, yes, it lays it out in the one-to-one -one space. We'll talk about that in a minute. But look at look at this. Nice, clean, perfect squares that are identical in size. Using that prescale option is the best reason to use the un, or the layout options. Um, so again, that's right here, prescale world. Turning that to prescale world and hitting apply um, will give you nice, consistent resolution across your model, uh, which is great because that's important. Um, however, let me close that now. Now that I've got this consistent scale that's useful, that brings up another point, the one-to-one -one space. So talking about the one-to-one -one space, this light gray area, and by the way, it says one to, it's the one-to-one -one space because you see there's a one in the corner and then there's a one in that corner. So that's the one-to-one -one space. It's usually, um, you know, you could see it by this lighter gray area in the middle of your texture there. Um, your texture needs to fit into that space. Um, that is your texture. If you load a Photoshop file or you know JPEG file, what the image file that you load onto your model fits in that gray area, that light gray area. So what does that mean? It means you have to have all your shells. Every single shell needs to it needs to fit into that space uh, when you're done unfolding. Again, you should be done unfolding before you bother to try to fit that. Um, but once you're done unfolding everything, then lay it out in here. By the way, again, be careful. This. Uh, Layout options window here, really dangerous. Do a save. I highly recommend you save right before you hit apply because I've seen this window crash Maya. Usually when it crashes Maya, I'm pretty sure it's because the UVs are still a mess. They're like, it's somebody is trying to skip unfolding certain things. They're like, oh, I'll just unfold this. Maybe I'll unfold that. Then I'm just gonna skip to this window and they, they don't bother to unfold the other pieces. Well, I've seen Maya choke and just burst into flames and crash entirely because there's something not unfolded and Maya freaks out. Maya's like, whoa, why are you trying to lay this out? It's not done unfolding. So I'm going to crash on you. So just uh, be wary. Make sure you, if you're going to try something crazy like that, make sure you save. Um, OK, but uh, that all that window aside, let's talk about the one to one space. Let's also talk about why we want this shaded UV display turned on. Uh, for a couple reasons. One, if I go to face mode, if I just scoot this face around, check this out. What happens when I overlap this face with that face or this face with that face? And again, in class, I force people to try to wake up and think about what the hell I'm saying. And look, it darkens, right? So the whole point is when you have shaded UV display on, overlapping UVs will darken. Um, and the beauty of that is it's a great visual cue. Oh crap, I'm overlapping those. Now, again, in class, I make people think, is is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, should I overlap UVs? Or, or is it okay to? Can I? Yeah, well, the answer is, like many things in this class, the answer is it depends. Did you do it on purpose? If you didn't do it on purpose, it's probably bad. Like, for instance, this. This probably is pretty awkward and not intentional, and it's probably going to screw you up. If you do this, however, again, keep in mind, if, if you lay this right on top of it, Check it out. That's the top panel and the bottom panel, right? Now, with the top panel and the bottom panel perfectly overlapping, what happens? Well, okay, this is my texture. So if I overlap those UVs perfectly, what's gonna happen? Well, whatever I paint right here shows up on both the top panel and the bottom panel. So what does that mean? Well, obviously, that's great for time efficiency. I only have to paint one panel. What is that? You know, what is that bad for? Well, clearly, it's not good for art because clearly, the top panel and the bottom panel of a cereal box typically aren't identical. You know, maybe they are in some cases. I don't know. Maybe you find an example of where it actually is, or maybe you just don't care. Maybe you're like, you know what? Screw it. I just want to make this fast and dirty and easy. I'll just paint one panel and put both those UVs overlapping. Sure. Okay. Fine. They share pixels. They share the texture space. Now something else to consider. Sure, it's good for time efficiency. It's also good, check this out, look how much more room that takes up on my texture sheet. 
spreading these two panels out, you know, making them take up, um, it's doubling the amount of pixels I have to take up. But not actually that. It's not just doubling. It's doubling the amount of pixels I'm taking up, but it also, you can't butt these up against each other so close. You just can't. You have to give each, each shell has to have padding. What do I mean? I mean, there has to be some pixels in between each shell. Why? Because if you don't put the padding, what's going to happen is no matter how careful you are in Photoshop, you're going to paint right down the edge really carefully, but it's going to bleed. The pixels aren't big enough, or the pixels are too big. The pixels aren't, um, it, unless you have a super high res image, and even then, you know, you shouldn't do that. But anyways, the point is, you're going to paint really carefully down the edge here, and the, those pixels right on the edge are going to bleed onto this other, uh, you know, this other shell. So you can't butt it right up against it. You have to give it some padding. So not only if you do this, you're basically saying, I need to have these panels separate. I need to have these different. I cannot have them both be identical. It's just going to look stupid. I need to have the top panel and the bottom panel different textures which you probably do, but I'm just saying, that's the trade-off. This is more efficient, takes up less room on the texture sheet, which again, frees up more pixels, frees up more pixels to do something else, else with. Um, but this gives you the opportunity to paint something asymmetrical and do something different with each panel. Okay, but that being said, so what I was saying about padding, you need padding in between the shells. You just can't get away from that. You have to have padding, at least some padding, um, more or less depending on your texture resolution, but that's another story, so we'll come back to that some other time. But anyways, so ideally, the best case scenario is less shells equals less padding, which means it's more efficient. So what you wanna shoot for at all times, whenever possible, make the shells as complete as possible where there's not one face by itself, a different face by itself. So what I can do here, I can just grab this edge, shift right click, move and sew. Bam, snaps that up there. I can grab this edge, shift right click, move and sew. I can go to the UV mode, grab the entire shell, scale it down. Oh, and yeah, again, manipulators, select, move, rotate, scale. Um, all those manipulators are the same hotkeys. They, they behave the same way, move, move key. I could rotate, but I'm gonna undo that because I don't want to. So move, rotate, scale. I do want to use this rotate though. This is really handy. Rotate counterclockwise, bam. And I want to double check that that's the top. Yep, it is. Because uh, I want, the, I do want the top facing up. Um, you don't have to. It just sure makes life easier. Whoops. Uh, sure makes life easier if the top is the top and you're painting it right side up. Just makes life a little bit more bearable when you're trying to paint this. Okay, again, still need some padding even around the edges. So keep an eye on that. But this is basically unfolded. And let's double check our shell, you know, our, our checkers. And the checkers look good. No distortion. And this is basically a nicely unwrapped cube. Again, it's just a cube. Which is why we do, the whole reason of doing a cube is because it's really easy. Uh, it's one of the most simple possible things you could do. So we're just trying to get the steps ingrained in your brain. Okay, but anyways, nicely unwrapped. Um, Nicely unwrapped cube. Now we just have to export it to Photoshop, get something painted, and then put it back into Maya, just because we, we do want to see it in Maya. But we, we want to put it back into Maya, make sure it works in Maya, and then we also want to export it to um, to Unity. So let's do that, okay? Um, so first thing, again, UV mode. Make sure all the UVs are selected, and I'll turn off my uh, checker just because I don't need to see it right now. Polygons. And then this is going to be tricky. I'm going to move this window all the way to the top here. In fact, yeah. So I'll move this all the way to the top just so you can see when I go to the polygons menu, if it's way at the bottom here, UV snapshot. So again, that's right here. Then I'll scoot this up so you can see polygons all the way at the bottom, UV snapshot. Bam. Now this window, let me show you the uh, reset it so you see the defaults. 256 is pretty small, so I'm going to change that to 1024. Let's make it a nice pretty cereal box. And then um, color, I like to choose a nice bright red. You don't have to do it. This is just, this is the color of what these edges, the color of the edges that you're gonna export. So that's what those, uh, with that, that's what that color's for is, is what color are the edges gonna be when you export this uh, image. 
Uh, Maya IFF uh, is Maya's default image format. Um, it is uh, probably best to leave that alone. It has transparency, which is awesome. So exporting, oh, and it also opens in Photoshop just fine. So Maya likes to do Maya IFF. Let's just let Maya have what she, what she wants because Maya can be a bitch if you don't give her what she wants. So Maya IFF uh, and then browse. Uh, I, now I'm gonna browse because I do uh, see this this will default because we have the project set it's going to default to trying to put it into the QBUV images folder because that's where Maya likes to output images but we're going to have to turn this into a texture well textures go into the source images folder so I'm just going to click click the up arrow go down to the source images I'm just going to shove it right into the source images right now no sense you know bothering to move it later so I'm going to go to the source images and I'm going to just type in uh, serial UVs. Serial UVs. Um, now that didn't export yet. I just created a path for it. Um, to get it exported, don't forget you still have to click OK. When you click OK, it should export to that uh, to that image, you know, or to, or to that folder. In fact, again, here's that folder source images. There it is, right there. Now, uh, what do I get? What am I going to do with it? Well, let's open with. And then, okay, this could take a second. Uh, more apps. Oh, there we go. Okay, Photoshop. Let's open it with Photoshop. Always use this app. That's fine. There it goes. My IFF opening in Photoshop. Um, and there it is. And so, check it out. Um, Photoshop's open. We've got the UVs right there. They may be a little hard to see right now. Um, so, um, here's what I'm going to do. First, very first thing I'm going to do, and you should be in this habit as well. I'm going to double click this layer zero and rename it to UV layer just because it's really kind of hard to see with all that transparency there. So I want to label it right away just so I'm like, oh, oh, that's my UV layer. Okay, cool. Um, and then I want to create a new layer, drag it below this layer, and then I'm going to use the paint bucket and drop down maybe just some uh, a layer of white. Why? Because then it makes it just makes it easier to see. Um, now, again, I have the UV layer on top, and you want to keep the UV layer on top because it uh, that way you can always see it. This this now, this Photoshop file, like the way it is, this is now like a coloring book. Now all you got to do is fill in the lines. So um, that's the easy part, right? Um, and again, hopefully you guys all have some Photoshop skills by now, but let me just blast you through this. Um, and by the way, if we're making cereal boxes, check this out. Bam, you just Google cereal box and check this out. People have for some reason, don't ask me why, people have for some reason decided to unfold physical cereal boxes, unfold physical cereal boxes and scan them at high resolutions. Don't ask me why, I have no idea. But I can just go in there, save the image, and then I can save it to, let's go to my uh, Maya Projects, QBV, source images, uh, and again, to the source images, um, just to keep things easy, save it there. And then that is now accessible for me to get in there. In fact, let me move this out of the way now. And, uh, I'm, and again, what I'm doing right now, going and, going and Googling and stealing cereal box images, this is the way to get a C. If you want to see, yeah, go ahead. Go steal a cereal box off Google and paste it in here using your Photoshop skills. That's fine. Um, if you want to hand paint a cereal box, I have seen some pretty funny ones. Uh, in fact, oh, you know what? I'll tell you what. I have a funny one that somebody turned in just today that I will show you guys uh, in a quick little side video I'll do in a minute. Uh, that one, it came out really nice, um, and uh, that will be a good example of how to get an A. Uh, but we'll come back to that. I um, just thought of that because I, I actually did take a minute to download that um, so I could um, share it. But anyways, okay, so... Um, so here we go. We've got this now uh, tricks tricks box that I can just drag in there. Uh, again, I can just scoot it kind of in place here, um, and I'm going to hold the shift key at first, at least to kind of get it. Uh, you know what? Ah, who cares? But I'm going to hit the enter key to get that lo layer locked down. Now, tricky, tricky, fun trick. Ready? Um, square tool, the square mark, the marquee tool. There. I'm just going to. In fact, let me zoom in so I can really see what I'm doing here. And then I'm going to click and drag just down to the front of it so that I get the entire front panel, but just the front panel. And then what I'm going to do, click the layer mask button. Bam. 
Now I just, that was just a quick, dirty, fast, easy way to give myself, to give myself this. This is the front panel. Now all I gotta do, I'll hit Control T right now. And now all I gotta do is basically line this up, scale it up, and again, I'm stretching it non-uniformly, which is not ideal. Let me turn off the snap. Uh, I'm stretching it non-uniformly, which is not ideal. It's it's kind of, it's gonna blur the pixels a bit. It's gonna smear the pixels. Uh, so that's not good. I'm just being, I'm just being quick and dirty and lazy. So don't do what I'm doing. Do it better. Do it better than I'm doing if you want, you know, a good grade, but whatever. Okay, so there's the front panel, bam. Uh, good to go. Now all I gotta do, copy this by dragging it, dragging the layer to this uh, create layer button. Right click on this, delete layer mask. Gets, it gives me the whole thing back so I, I can start fresh. Now I'm just gonna do the same thing, but with the rear panel. So the rear panel, bam. Marquee selection, layer mask, Control T, scoot it over a bit. In fact, I don't even really need to Control T that. I could have just moved it. But anyways, move it into place and there we go. Um, now the front and back panel are done. I can duplicate this again. Delete the layer mask, create a new layer mask that gives me the side panel, and marquee select, layer mask, bam, side panel, good to go. In fact, I'm gonna just scoot this down below these panels just so that uh, it looks like it's you know positioned pretty well actually. So I'll just scoot it to the bottom just in case. But then I'll go back up here and then, oops, uh, duplicate this one first, duplicate, delete the layer mask, grab myself, the top panel and bam top panel layer mask and then now again I just gotta scoot this into position however this one is gonna need some squishing unfortunately better not to squish it's better not to squish um, because again you see the distortion happening now uh, in the pixels that's not good really you should just use your Photoshop skills, use the clone stamp, use, you know, use the Photoshop tools available to you to make this, you know, to do better. But again, I'm just being quick and dirty and lazy because I'm trying to demonstrate this uh, as fast as I can. Uh, but anyways, I'm going to drag this below a little bit as well. Uh, oops. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to even bother, uh, you know, for the side other side panel, again, I'm just going to be quick and dirty and lazy. I'm gonna hold the I'm like, I'm, in, I'm on the move tool and I'm just gonna hold the Alt key and click and drag and then I'll hold the Alt and Shift key to drag it perfectly horizontally. Bam! I'm just being like now again. That's lazy. That's not even efficient. Sure, it's efficient time wise. It saved me a few seconds, but that's lazy. The side panels being identical. That's not real. In fact, you know you could tell it's not real because you just you know <laughs> look at it without the uh, the layer mask. Look, there's the other side panel right there. You know, it's not the way it's supposed to be. I'm just saying. Um, anyway, I just wanted to make that point. But I'm not going to do the bottom panel either. I just want to get this tutorial done. So, okay, let's assume that I actually did do this correctly and nicely, and I'm ready to put it back into Maya. Just FYI, the UV layer, don't forget to turn that off. Just hide it. Don't delete it. Just hide it. Just hide it and then save. Um, why? Because otherwise the UVs come back into Maya, oh, you know, and that's not really, that's not ideal. So you don't want to do that. And just so you know, I forget. I forget to turn this off almost every time, at least the first time. And then I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. All right. So then I start to remember, just saying, double check, make sure this is turned off or hidden uh, when, you, when you're ready to export to Maya. Now, what should you save as? Well, first of all, you should save as a Photoshop file. You should always save as a Photoshop file first. Why? Because you want to hold on to these layers and your master document with the UVs and everything. Just in case you want to go back in and go, oh, well, you know what? Let me hide all those. Let me grab in a new serial and I'll use the UVs. And, you know, all I'm saying is always save your Photoshop file. Okay, now that being said, after you've saved the Photoshop file, do you want to put a Photoshop file into Maya? And again, in class, I would say, can you put the Photoshop file into Maya? The answer is yes. Yes, you can. Just because, just because you can doesn't mean it's a good idea. So yes, you can put a Photoshop file into Maya. No, don't do it. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. 
Yes, you can, but you know what? Guess what? You can't put a Photoshop file into uh, into a game engine. So yeah, save the Photoshop file. Then do a save as. And when you do a save as, now you save, and I'll tell you what, you're gonna save as a JPEG. Why JPEG? I'll tell you right now. Uh, and let's name it, let's name it serial. Now, okay, I could name this serial color. I could also name it serial diffuse. I could also name it serial albedo. Albedo, albedo, I don't, I don't even know. And why could I name it any one of those things? Because they all mean fucking color. I don't know why they decided to differentiate. Because diffuse means color in you know a lot of the game engines and and the, uh, the 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 you know the Maya pipelines and so forth. Diffuse is color. Oh, cool. Well, why didn't they just call it color? I don't know. I don't know why they didn't call it color. Uh, now albedo also means color. Again, this is now for the PBR shaders. Okay, we use PBR materials now. They're way cooler. They're so cool. I love them. I do. I think they're awesome. Why they couldn't just fucking call this color? I don't know. Uh, but it's color. So serial, albedo. In fact, what you should be using now in the Unity 5, it's going to be albedo. So if you want to call it albedo, at least, you'll, at least then you'll know where to put it. You know, you put it on the albedo channel. Uh, okay, so I'm going to save that. Bam. Save that. Okay, yes, JPEG. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. Um, JPEG. Cool. And then, bam, now that is saved out and ready to put into Maya. So let's go back to Maya. I'm just gonna close Photoshop. Um, and here we go. Um, how do we put it onto this? Right now, that is not applied to this. Let's go back to object mode, select the object. And in fact, let's also do this. Um, I mean, just first of all, shrink this because we're mostly done with it. Um, but let me delete this history. See, there's some history there. So just to be on the safe side, edit, Delete all by type history. Uh, and then uh, also, I'm going to modify freeze transformations because when we export to Unity, if I don't freeze transformations, things can get weird. So modify freeze transforms. Cool. Now zeroes this out, and that's good to go. Now I'm going to apply a material. So I'm going to right click, assign new material, and that gives me this uh, assign new, new material uh, P cube one. This node here, well, I'm just going to do a blend because it's shiny. So that gives me, again, my attribute editor should pop up. Um, and it usually, again, it pops up over there. It docks over here. I usually tear mine off, just so you know. Not that it matters. But uh, but anyways, but in the attribute editor, I'm going to click on the blend one over here. Don't forget to label it. Label your new, your new material because if you don't, you're going to be constantly overwriting your materials in, in Unity. Every time you export, you're going to export a new blend one, and it's going to overwrite your material in Unity. And you're going to be like, ah, why does my chair have a table texture? Because you keep overwriting your freaking materials because you didn't name it like I told you to. So anyways, um, here we go. Blend one is now going to be, what is it? Oh, it's tricks. Tricks, serial, material. Tricks, serial, material. All right, so now again, now that I've applied the material, I could choose a color. You know, I've showed you guys that in class. Oh, look, I can apply colors. I can make it colorful. Cool. But here's the real powerful thing. In Maya, anytime, and that could be a lot of times, by the way, anytime you see one of these checker boxes, that little checker box to the right of something, that means that this attribute can be controlled by a texture map or by something else, actually. It could be any kind of render node, which means you can get really fancy, crazy, crazy shader networks in here which is great, but you can't use those anyway. So if I click on this, it gives me this create render node dialog. And look, there's so many cool things. Look, I can play, oh, and there's more things and other things and more things. Yeah, but you know what? Don't use any of that. All of that's really neat, but not for video games. So what do you want? You want file, fourth one down, file. That's all you need, just click file. And then when you, it, it, again, it jumped me right to this little window here in the uh, attribute editor. So then from here, what you want to do is click the little yellow folder and then you know, hook up this serial albedo. Open. Bam. There it is. It's loaded. Now, again, this is a very common thing. Check it out. If I, if I click on the model, look, there it is. It's in the texture editor. Oh, yeah, sweet. OK, wait, it loaded the texture. Wait a minute. How come it's not showing up in the viewport? And I get for years, for years now, I would get this same question. 
people are frantically freaking out. Go, oh my God, my textures aren't showing up. My textures aren't showing up. And the first question I'm always going to ask is, did you hit the six button on your keyboard? Six key. I'm just saying. Six key. Um, that's all. And now, again, if you hit the six key, check it out. Look. It, it 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 basically toggles this button on right here. This little button right here in the you know the viewport controls textured. It just turns on textures in the viewport. So the six key again, the five key turns off textures. Six key turns on textures. So this is shaded mode. This is shaded with textures. Just don't forget turn on the six key. Don't freak out. It's fine. If you see it here, then it's it's working. It's just not on. It's just not turned on in the viewport. So hit the six key. There you go, no problem. Okay, there we go. That that now again, this used to be all I would ask for. Uh, this would be a C if you did this in my previous classes. Well, obviously, aside from the lack of effort trying to finish it, um, but this would be basically. In fact, because of that, I would give myself a C minus right now. I would give myself a C minus for this because I didn't really, I didn't really take the trouble to like do a good job in Photoshop. But anyways, the point is, I would give this a C minus. So do better, do better than that. Um, now, if you hand painted this or you did something silly, you know, like a silly Photoshop, um, you know, you put your own face in there and you made your own serial, whatever. If you do something creative and unique and different, you don't just steal an image off Google, that's one way to get some points. Um, and again, I'll show you, um, I'll upload a video soon about uh, of the other guy, the guy that did really well today in class. Um, the best way to get more points, to get a better grade if you want to shoot for an A, is to unwrap multiple things. You don't. You could do a cereal box. But you could do other things besides the cereal box. You could do multiple cereal boxes. You could do a table. You could do. Basically, I would encourage you to stick with cubes, because cubes are the only thing I've taught you how to unwrap so far. But you can do all kinds of things with cubes. You can unwrap a bunch of different cubes and use them to create a scene. That's the best possible way to get an A is to create a scene out of cubes that you've unwrapped and textured, um, and put some thought into it. I've seen some pretty creative. Um, I, I saw one today where somebody did a uh, a vault. It was a, the inside of a vault with a desk and a lamp and a, and a, a bowl of cereal. But the vault was containing uh, the vault contained a bunch of cereals. It was like I don't know, super fancy cereals that like were locked in a in this giant vault and whatever. But I'm like I, I don't know where he got the idea, but it was kind of funny. And um, he created the whole scene just to support the cereals. Anyways, like I said, uh, something like that is a good way to get an A, but we'll come back to that. So anyways, now, what do we do now? Well, we got to, we have to get this out to Unity. So first of all, we have to create a new Unity project um, for this whole scenario. Let me, uh, in fact, let me just open Unity, and I'll pause the video for a second. Okay, so I've got Unity open and ready to go. I created a new project called Serial. And now all I need to do is export from Maya directly into this folder. I created a folder here you see called 3D Models that I am sitting right in and ready to go. So I just got to create um, create that scenario. So I'm going to go back to Maya. And then um, I learned a new trick, actually. One of my students taught me a new trick. I was kind of sure that it could do this at some somehow. But um, anyways, so let me show you something fun and new uh, to make life easier. Ready? File. Export selection, that's not new. That's all normal, right? So check this out. File export selection. These should all be, um, uh, you know, uh, you should all un you should understand these by now. Smoothing groups, you know, um, and then scrolling down, you want to go to turn off automatic, switch to meters because you want scale factor 0.01 because Unity is in meters. Uh, then now this is new. Um, I've just been switching. I was telling you to switch to 2013 FBX 2013 just in case. I would say that's probably safer, but I'll tell you what, um, I've just been letting it stay at the default, which is 2014 slash 2015. It seems to be working okay, so I don't know if I would worry about that. But the checking checking this, if you have problems with your import or export from Maya to Unity, maybe double check this, um, do some research, do some Googling, troubleshoot. This is one thing I would troubleshoot. But anyways. Um, here is the new fancy things, uh, a new fancy thing that I've uh, learned that you could do. Because Mudbox exports the, uh, models with textures intact, and I'm like, well, that's pretty pretty useful. It saves me the step of having to hook them up. Well, Maya can do it too, I guess. If you just open up this embed media, click on embed media. Now, when I export, and I should navigate to that folder, so let me go to 
my Unity projects and serial and assets, 3D models. If I label this tricks box, tricks box. Now, as soon as I hit export, as long as I have embed media turned on, it's going to export the model and it's going to export the texture right to that folder. So I click that, bam. I can switch right back to Unity. There it is. And as soon as I go back to Unity, bam, there it is right here. It's exported the material. Uh, there's that. There's a material for it, and in, in a, you know, a, an amazing, awesome, you know, feat. It also exported the texture into this separate folder. So, um, so that's pretty handy. It's gonna, it's gonna keep things. Uh, it saves you a few steps, basically, because otherwise, you know, I could drag this in, of course, and I want to do scale one, 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 and then um, there you go. I've got a cereal box in Unity. Um, and again, I have, um, if you didn't, if it didn't work, like if you didn't get your texture, if it broke, then all you gotta do is go get the texture. Um, you just go get the texture in Windows and you can literally just drag it right into the, the uh, Unity folder. So you drag the texture in and you can literally just drag the texture. If you want to, you can just drag the texture right onto the model in the viewport. Uh, otherwise, the better way to do it would be to go here, select the material so that it pops up here. Again, here's the albedo. And you see that the albedo has the um, has the texture already hooked up to it um, because of the way we embedded the media. But if it didn't, you could go here and drag it, click and drag right onto that scenario, uh, right onto that channel. You could also see where it says albedo. You can also click on the little circle, and then that loads this window here that you can then click on whichever map you want to associate to it. So if you need to hook up a texture manually. You just go to the material, you know, select the material, go to the inspector window, and then click on whichever map you need to load. You can click on the circle, or you could just drag the texture onto the little square. So again, you could adjust your material properties here if you want. If you want a glossier serial box, more glossy, turn this up. Less glossy, turn it down. Mm, I don't know of any material or any uh, cereal boxes that are metallic, so probably don't want to mess with this for the at least for a cereal box. Normal maps are exciting. We'll come back to those later, but this is it. This is a C. If you get, you know, again, if you get a cereal box this far, if you get the cereal box with textures into Unity, you need to, of course, you need to create a ground plane to walk on, and you you should probably create a table of some sort at least. So it's not just sitting on the floor, but you need to create a ground plane to walk on. So we don't, you know, so we have somewhere, you know, we can walk up to it. Uh, maybe make it a little bigger, and then you know, it'd be again, ideally, create a whole scene. You know, create a kitchen, create a kitchen, put this inside of a kitchen, have fun with this. Uh, but anyways, um, this, and then of course, you need to, you can just get rid of this main camera. Because you should, of course, import the characters and then import a first-person camera. And uh, I think a lot of people are having some problems with this because you import the first-person cameras. I'm not sure why, but a lot of people have been having broken cameras. Um, they have a camera, but it seems to be broken where um, where you can't look up and down. You can only look left and right. And I'm not sure what's going on with that. So let me just go over that one more time. Standard assets, characters, uh, prefabs, FPS controller, drag it right in there, and then bam, now you could hit play, and you should be able to eventually, bam, there you go, there you go. Now, again, this works. This works, I can walk up to it, look at it. It's a, it's a completed asset, sort of. <laughs> it's a completed asset inside of Unity, and it works. And now you just got to do a web build. I'm not going to go over the web build again. Even though a lot of you seem to be having problems with the web build, you shouldn't be because I've covered it enough times. So go back and watch my web build explanations again. But anyways, um, so you should export a web build like this and then also turn in your Maya file because I need to see both because I need to make sure if it looks good in, in Unity, then you probably did it right. But I still want to make sure. I want to make sure that you did this properly not just like oh you kind of made it work so don't forget turn in your my file and, and ideally turn in your my file in a project folder with the project set up properly 
then also turn in a web build because I also want to see that you can get it into Unity. And then once you, and when you get it into Unity, that it works and it's not broken. Okay, cool. And that's it for the QBVs demo. This is the cereal box you should have. Again, uh, I will, in a moment, I will show you uh, the, you know, a project that was turned in today that came out very well. In fact, you know, I'm just going to pause this video real quick, pause the recording, and I will pull it up right now. Okay, so it appears I didn't bring home all the files I needed to. I thought I did, but uh, it's broken. So I will have to find it tomorrow when I go back to work tomorrow, and uh, I will attempt to... I will try to uh, make a video tomorrow, hopefully, um, so you guys can see that, a good example of an A project. But anyways, um, so that's it for this QBV um, assignment. Uh, you should know what to do. This is a C. If you want a uh, better than a C, just add more cool stuff and more better cooler, right? All right, and I will see you in the next video where I will unwrap the heart throne. Again, I already have a video for this, but um, you may not, uh, you know, it may not be uh, updated. So we'll uh, get a more up-to-date version of this um, that has the new features and uh, avoid the pitfalls of some of the crappy new features. So anyways. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next video.